Okay, we're back. We're live for the one o'clock block here on a given Tuesday uh, with Stephanie Dalton. And uh, she is one of our hosts and guests. And she's all over the dial on ThinkTech. <laughs> but one thing about Stephanie is very important is that she lived for many years in Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. is worth talking about today. A matter of fact, our, our show is, quote, should Washington, D.C. be made a state? Um, here at Rediscovering America. Welcome to the show, your show, Stephanie. Uh, oh, well, I know this is a, a wonderfully shared show and that's one of the pleasures of uh, being uh, uh, invited on it, Jay. So thank you. I'm so Washington, Washington has got uh, some, something around 800,000 people. It's uh, a little smaller than the population of, of Honolulu, uh, certainly smaller than the population of Hawaii. Um, it's largely African American. Everybody says that, and I think that's probably true. Um, and uh, that um, Washington has had a, a history such as the federal government has had. You know, the Capitol was burned down in 1814 in the lingering last days of the War of 1812. I used to teach a course, you know, and I would start my here, and, and I would start my class. I would say, <clears throat> "Can anybody tell me in what year uh, they had the War of 1812?" You know, crickets. <laughs> Nobody would answer. Well, the they said, oh, a trick question. It's a trick question. But you know, it is a trick question because the War of 1812 lasted longer than 1812. <laughs> and, and, and the British burned down the Capitol in 1814. Anyway, <clears throat> bottom line is it's really had a history such as the country itself. And it's worth looking at now because of you know, the, all the machinations that have happened around the election and criticizing various jurisdictions. And what we have found um, to be certain disadvantages uh, that the citizens of Washington DC have vis-a-vis -vis other states uh, in terms of voting and mm, suppression of voting and so forth. Um, and, and that's, we should talk about that because the issue has again been raised. But let's talk about the importance of Washington first, though, Stephanie. Uh, what kind of a city is it historically and in modern day? Well, his, historically, um, the city has a fascinating history, and um, it 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 was appropriated out of Maryland and Virginia, and uh, the the founders wanted a federal district, and that is one of the controversial points here, as far as the issue of statehood's concerned is that did the founders want a federal city to actually have the powers of a state? And that was a very uh, important uh, interpretation of, well, there will be a very important interpretation of what it is that they thought they wanted it to be, which impacts on the bill that's in Congress now having passed the House and getting ready to go through the Senate or I don't know if they're getting it ready yet. There are other things to do that precede this, I'm sure. but. It needs to get the get the bill passed uh, through the Senate in order to take on um, to see if they can actually move it towards statehood. But after it was brought into um, the the east east coast there next to Maryland and Virginia, it was a square that was taken out of uh, the shores of the Potomac River, and then um, it was. I think there's a poignant story here is that that was all done about in 19, I mean, in 1790. And they really didn't get um, the city together until um, 1801 when they passed some more acts about uh, residency there and how it was gonna use. And I think the poignant piece is that George Washington for whom the city is named um, was out of his, his majestic leadership roles and into his life at Mount Vernon, which is deep in Virginia and on the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, he was doing his, what he always dreamed of doing at post his career in politics and governance. And then of course he got sick and he died in uh, 1800. So he was infected with a, a throat a virus and um, could have been one like we know now, but there wasn't any about it. He had to, he left. So before the city actually but it was developed, you know, he, but he had to go on, but it was named after him and he knew that that, that had happened. But what, 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 what happened to the, the actual land is that when you go to Washington DC, you see that there is a Pentagon that's actually in Virginia 
and other federal land that's in Virginia, which is on the old part of the piece of Virginia that was taken and uh, reapportioned into the District of Columbia. But along about 1830, as the country was um, looking after its, in, its various needs, they realized in, the, in Virginia and the South that the slavery issue was a problem. And of course, Virginia had slavery and DC didn't at that time in the same way. But the uh, concern for the Virginians was that the Congress was gonna pass a law outlawing slavery and their, their economy was in disarray. And so they, they wanted to then pull themselves back from being a part of the district. So at that point, the Congress did respond and give the Virginia piece of Washington back to Virginia. So now all of the land that is the federal city plus the other um, areas of residence, those are, uh, that's Maryland land. Mm -hmm. But um, but but it is under this federal federal arrangement that has been has been found to be lacking for the citizens in it as far as representation and having any influence, you know, in the country like an, a state should have. It's different uh, in terms of the city planning too. Uh, Washington was designed. Um, I, I don't know who did it, but I'm sure it was a visionary architect as a federal city, as the seat of government, um, and. Um, therefore, you have these broad boulevards, you have the numbered streets, um, all very rational. Um, and, you know, like some other cities in Europe are like that. Um, yeah, because and, and, by European Pierre Lafont designed the city. And ah. Banneker was his, his associate. So he was kind of the co-designer and he hasn't gotten a lot of attention because he's an African-American man. But he was really responsible also for the design of Washington, D.C., and uh, which is beautiful. It is, it's a beautiful city. Um, you know, it doesn't have the skyscrapers. I guess that's against the zoning code. Um, it, it, it has uh, these broad boulevards, a lot of parks, a lot of green, green areas, waterways and the like. It's a, it's a pretty city to walk around, run around. A lot of people do. It's a, it has lots of places for recreation. I recall the towpath, if you remember the towpath. That was oh, uh, a really, yeah, yeah, beautiful place. The Georgetown part has always been Georgetown. <laughs> it's been there since the very beginning. So it was there before um, this federal city was, but it was included in the federal city. But the Georgetown had its own town and its own um, issues there mm -hmm. and its own structure, right? But, um, yeah. but the federal city was designed then by this Pierre L'Enfant, who you always his, hear his name, but it's only recently that Benjamin Banneker is also understood to have been a major uh, designer of the city as well. And I, I think he was from France as well, or I, I don't really know where his background, but I think he came with Pierre L'Enfant. But um, yeah, if, if so you this... have the land, if you have the land and you have the, the broad boulevards connecting the land, uh, then you can build big, uh, edifices, big public buildings. You could build the Smithsonian. You could build the, you know, the courts, the National Archives. So many beautiful buildings in Washington, and so spacious and so statuesque is what they are. So the city has done well in terms of architecture, although the residential areas, uh, which are not immediately in the in the federal part of the city, um, are just outside it. How does that work? Well, they're designated areas, which are obvious when you're there to, uh, because they're, they're characterized by green grass that's kept up and, and beautiful uh, white marble buildings. And, uh, and the mall is the center of that. And those are uh, the, federal, the federal area of the city. And, and uh, then Washington DC is just beyond that, like just a block off the mall is the, the federal city. Where, you're, where that then becomes the responsibility of the city and the city's budget and the city's laws and the city schools and, and uh, their own council, which serves as their legislature. And they have their own uh, judicial system, but those judges are all appointed by the president. And that, that's another place where there is not the, the same um, rights for people that, uh, that states have and that this, this city would have if it were state. And it has a mayor instead of a governor. And that's a big difference to, uh, at the level of power and influence. So there are several areas that are really clearly depri depriving the city of its governance. Mm -hmm. 
So it's just the first time that people have been interested in making Washington DC into a state uh, or has this come up before? Oh, this has come up many, many times. And, uh, and I think it came up even before Hawaii and Alaska were involved. It's been, they've taken umbrage at the restrictions on their rights as citizens, those who have lived in the district and, um, and have been agitating about it for, for decades and decades and maybe a century because they want that the people that live there want to be the state. They have taxation without representation and they have the highest taxes per capita in the world. I mean, excuse me, in the in the country, mm -hmm. and uh, their taxes are more than twenty two other states. So, you you know, there there is quite a contribution being made by the the residents of the city, and they have no as a result of being a, a federal district, the District of Columbia, and Columbia is this woman that is a, a is a, a caricature, or she represents the notion of the the Republican. That's Columbia, and so they made it. Um, they made her the um, personification of, mm. of, the, of mm. the capital of the country. So that's why it's the District of Columbia. I, I take it the people who would see, who have sought and now are seeking statehood for Washington uh, are the people who live in Washington. They're the citizens of Washington. They're the, the people who occupy the residential areas outside the federal district in Washington, right? Well, more than ever, there's, there are many proponents because, and especially now that there's a, a democratic uh, control of, of the governor, go, government, because there are no senators. Um, there are two shadow senators who don't even have a seat in Congress. I guess they can hang out in the upper areas and look over the rail. Um, they have um, no reps that the one representative is the delegate, Eleanor Holmes Norton, and she's been that for 30, 40 years, but she has no vote in the Congress. She's made herself very influential and she's responsible for the bill currently that is in the chain of events to get to the Senate, to see if we can get it through the Senate. It's already passed the house that would allow the state to be, um, the, the city to be transferred into a state. And, uh, and that, that's the way that's the way all the states have come in, right? It's by an act of Congress. Every single state you know, outside the original 13 colonies came in by virtue of an act of Congress, a bill, a statute, like every other statute. And presto, you know, you have all those states. And that's but one thing that sticks in my brain is that sometimes there had to be deals. Uh, like, for example, when the people in Congress, the, the lawmakers in Congress, some of them wanted this state and others wanted that state um, because of some issue, maybe Democratic, Republican, who knows what. And so they made a deal. They said, well, I'll let your state in if you let my state in. And then we'll have both states in the same, you know, spate of legislation. And then we'll have two more states or whatever, a bubble of states come in on a negotiated basis. I know that happened a few times in the 19th century. Well, but, just but, though, Jay, because Alaska and Hawaii, they were a great couple of states to bring in because one was red, one was blue, one was hot, one was cold. I mean, it absolutely was a perfect match of differences that didn't upset what was the balance in the, in the government. Mm. Whereas DC coming in, it's a blue state, and uh, the only other one suggested to accompany it is Puerto Rico, which is way, way also too a blue state. Yeah. So you've got that problem. And right now, if they come in, they um, would really upset the balance of the government in the Congress. Um, perhaps not so much in the House of Representatives, but um, certainly would increase the numbers again. But but then to make the uh, Senate have two more senators is what is one of the sticking points. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, that would certainly upset the balance. But, but the, you know, it'd be a fair representation of the of the of the population and the electorate, though. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's really unfair right now. But the but as you say, what are the requirements for being the state? Well, I, what I was reading is that there are three prerequisites, really three prerequisites that have been uh, about getting it to be a state. You have to have resources and population. I don't know what all the degrees of of uh, specifics in the population are meant, but you'd mentioned something about 
the racial makeup of Washington, D.C. I mean, in 1970, according to the census, there was a 70% African-American population. And I think at that time, it, well, it popped the state over into being like California, a majority minority state. But the census, what, what reports are now from 217 are that the, um, the state's population of African-Americans is I think 45%, 47% almost 50, going towards 50, and the uh, white population is 45%. So it's still a little bit uh, majority uh, African-American. Oh, so it's actually changed. Uh, so that's a significant change in the past uh, few decades. Huh? Yeah. Well, they're moving to the suburbs because the suburbs are in Maryland. So you've heard of Prince George's County and places like that that are the names of Baltimore County. So they're moving out that way uh, because it's less expensive. There's been lots of gentrification in Washington, even though you still have large swaths of public housing and uh, you know, low income housing and then fabulous houses like the Trumps and, and the owner of, um, you know, of these big, uh, what, what, Amazon. I mean, yeah. there's fabulous, they're fabulous. So, uh, is it fair to say then that the, the, the Republicans uh, in general, and I guess uh, for a long time, well, for some time that that has meant the Senate um, would oppose Washington uh, as a state, as they would oppose Puerto Rico as a state. Yeah, I think that that is probably more than the Senate. Also, I, I really would say um, that I think it's not a lo just a local issue, a local intention and desire and crusade. I think there are bigger bigger issues here that that have been driving it, and that population is one of them. And um, the overarching, the, they think overwhelming influence that then the, that city would have, that city's government might have more influence than the other states. I mean, think of that, that it would actually, you know, have a vote from their senators and reps, but they might also accrue additional, um, you know, oomph for, for certain issues. But um, anyway, so there, the, the second and third criteria for becoming a state or prerequisites, as they were referring to them, had to do with... Um, the uh, support for that they have enough support for statehood, which is my point that I think it's more than a local issue, but they also have to have a commitment to democracy. Now, I don't know how they measure any of all of that, but there are probably some tests for the. Uh, the I know that, 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 that sounds like it would be appropriate for a state in the West uh, yeah. or even Hawaii or Alaska, but not for Washington. I mean, yeah. they sit in the lap of democracy. You know, yeah. Shouldn't be an issue about that. But, so, but, you know, just shaking and baking it, what it sounds like is that uh, the people who live there are not, not getting the same, you know, political benefits. Um, and uh, the, and they, want to, they want to have those benefits and they want to be treated like uh, other places with the same population and so forth. And um, the people in Congress uh, see that as throwing the balance off. So they have opposed it, uh, or at least from other states, they have opposed it. I'm sure there's a lot of people, especially the Democrats, who the blue states, you know, who would like to see it happen. So the, you know, how can it happen under these circumstances is the question. I mean, it hasn't happened up till now. You mentioned people have been trying for a long time. Um, is it is it is there a chance, a prayer that it's going to happen now? Well, the, there is a belief there's going to be a chance. And, and already they've got the bill from the delegate to the House of Representatives from D.C., Eleanor Holmes Norton, who's a very capable uh, per lawyer, and she's served in this role for a long time, and she's managed to get that bill that far. So um, Has it the, passed the House? The House. It's passed the House. Passed the House. Okay. So um, it's up on the website if anybody wants to read the details, but it's then got to get through the Senate. And that just wasn't much of a possibility until, until now again, it is with people that would be willing to think about it. But there, you can just see what you've already talked about, the tremendous resistance to that there would be because it would immediately change. I mean, there are three ways. I mean, we changed the, the Senate's numbers, okay, and the balance. But um, that's only if they come in as a state. There are two other ways that can come in. They can have another recession, like when they gave the, the land back to Virginia that was in, uh, or originally taken to be part of the federal city. They gave that land back. 
um, they could also give the land that's not the federal property back to Maryland and then have people go uh, vote in Maryland and then they would have their reps and they would also have already, they're, they're said there wouldn't be any more senators, there wouldn't, there may be some more reps. And then the, um, there was a third way um, it, it could come in, uh, which was just giving people just voting rights, just say go, go vote wherever you want in the metropolitan area mm-hmm. and, and not bother anybody about any more representation for you. <laughs> you know, but keep paying those taxes. Well, you know, you could make a pretty good case for letting them vote in the adjacent states and um, redefining the district to be just the federal district. That's all. So all the federal That's- buildings and all those big avenues and you don't need the residential areas to be included in that. It just, it's the way it happened after the Civil War, I guess. Um, but it, it just, it's not essential to the operation of the government or the preservation of the national capital. Yeah, yeah that was gonna, that's gone on from 1801. And when they the, the, they had a, a bill co- go through called the Organic Act of 1801, which Washington missed, but that was what started them, the construction and the laying out of the federal city, the federal city part. Yeah, so, if you could take the federal city and just limit DC to the federal city and just make the border of the federal city out, uh, you know, outside the, the government area, the federal government area, and everybody else is in another state in yeah. the adjacent adjoining states. But let me, let me ask you this though. I mean, we, we have an interesting problem in our hands right now, today, tomorrow, uh, about the security of, of the federal city, the security of the Capitol, security of the White House, security of the Supreme Court, the three branches of our democratic government. And, and uh, it, it's been shattering to recognize that people, American people can come to the Capitol and, and, and take over, um, take over one of our you know, most important buildings. That building is probably, mm, the most important of the, I don't know if I can say this, the most important of the three branches of government. That's where its heart lives. That's where its initiatives are designed. Um, that's where the public, that's where the public is represented day after day after day. I guess it is the most important branch of government. And we've seen a breach of that security in so many awful ways in the past you know, two weeks. And so the question is, um, how does making Washington, how, how about redrawing the boundary of Washington or making it a state? How does that affect the security of the, of the, the central government, the federal government? Well, I, the federal government has all access to whoever they want to bring in there. They could bring in a thousand helicopters to drop paratroopers down to take care of business if they wanted to. And why didn't they last week? But the other, the other aspect of this is that Mayor Bowser, Muriel Bowser is the current mayor of DC, which of course is, has only a mayor, there is no governor. She was then prohibited from bringing in National Guard. There's no, no connection to that, those kinds of powers for the DC mayor. So right, right now, I mean, there's, there's a, 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 you know, an example you know, recently of how she was constrained for protecting her city. And I think that also was the case when there was the difficulty with the Lafayette Square and the president visiting the Lafayette Square during the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations. I think she was very constrained and, and had few options and worried about the ones that she did have. have. I mean, because painting on the streets, even, even putting up signs and things like that on the federal property, like the Lafayette Square, which is in front of the White House, and was original, co- originally considered to be included in the White House, except that they wanted the White House to have more uh, close proximity to the people. And, and uh, so they didn't put it in the White House. So, I mean, that, but that still is federal property too. So there's some quasi places like that, you know, like in front of the Lincoln Memorial, you know, there's some places where they would have to be working out some uh, considerations about, is that the federal city or is that not? And of course, the expenses that the budget for taking care of any of these beautiful um, edifices, you know, has to stay with with the feds because uh, the city can't afford. Yeah. It. I'm just wondering for security, for security of the government, whether it's better or worse to make a state out of it, because you know I don't think the existing 
arrangement um, proved up very well in terms of protecting the capital. Uh, you're right, the mayor was unable to get the army to respond or the National Guard. It was hours and hours before anyone could get them to come into the city. Um, on the other hand, you know, to have them there all the time is, is troubling somehow, to have it as an armed city. I mean, look how uncomfortable everyone is about having, you know, um, uniformed military people by the thousands, by the tens of thousands there now. That's troubling to have it become an armed city sleeping in the capital like a banana republic. Um, so you know, I wonder, I wonder what happens if you make it a completely federal situation, a federal enclave, so to speak, where, where it controls it, it has immediate access to the Army National Guard. I mean, there's, there's something troubling about that. Um, or if you make it a state uh, where it has no better, no worse access to military and protection and security. Uh, you, have you thought about that? Can you comment on that? Well, not, not on, that's such a good question that you raise. That's the one, who would have thought about protect military activity or you know, that level of, of, of security, um, life-threatening security and uh, what do you call that? Uh, in harm's way, security. Um, until this past week, um, the thoughts have been for the representation, the taxation, the people's right to be represented and uh, the unfair burden that falls on people like the delegate to, um, the, rep to the Congress, the House of Representatives. I mean, she's so busy <laughs> taking, taking care of her citizens that everybody's hesitant ever asked me to, you know, would, we'd have to have a major issue to take to her. It's not like having several representatives and, and two senators. That you can, uh, re, re, you know, uh, you know, retreat to. So well, no, it, stri it strikes me, Stephanie, that what what happened on the sixth and since, um, and the whole focus on the capital and and the troops in you know in the capital, the way they're deployed now, and the troops and the fences and all this all around Washington, it strikes me just in the clarity of this discussion. Washington will never be the same as it was. We took it for granted in many ways. We took security of the Capitol and the other branches of government and, and we, you know, we, we, we took it for granted. But now I don't think we can take it for granted. You can have people come in from North, North Dakota and um, attack the thing. And you can, have, uh, um, um, you can have people breaking down the doors. We never saw that, never. Uh, except, except the British in 1814, we never saw that happen in the history of the country, and now it has happened, and it has it has opened everyone's eyes to the possibility it might happen again. Ergo, you know, I don't think we'll we'll take all the troops out after this is more relaxed. I, but, I, it will always be a city that has to protect itself. Well, one of the loss is huge now that you're bringing it up, and I um, I'm done by that. I'm really startled. I mean, that was the place where during the years I've lived, I mean, I was born there and was a child there and I've been in and out of the city and uh, obviously I'm uh, in Hawaii, but I um, would never hesitate to walk down the mall in the night, in the middle of the night, certainly with a friend, but I mean, you could do it a lot. There's nobody there. There was never any threat. It was rare. I mean, you could go two blocks into Washington, D.C. Uh, off the federal property, and then, you know, they're homeless, and they're the same that we have here in Honolulu or any other big city, but not on the federal property. It was uh, truly a, a heavenly option to, to enjoy while you're there, and the gardens and all of that, but that will change now. They're, they've been violated. The whole thing's been violated. It's, and, and there's always a, what do you call it, a reaction. There's always a reaction when you have this sort of thing. And so, I mean, do we really need to have 20,000 troops there right now? That could be an overreaction. And will we need to have a, a standing complement of say 5,000 or 10,000 troops just in case? That may be an overreaction, but that's what happens when you have this kind of um, you know, terrorism. You always have a reaction. Sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's an overreaction. But I think we're gonna have a reaction. But what about the, that Nancy Pelosi always talks about, and others too, um, 
other leaders too, that as you said earlier, it is the people's house. The Congress is the people's house, like the Library of Congress next door to it. People are supposed to have access. The, the citizen is supposed to have access, just like you do. You walk right into the Senate office buildings. You can walk right into Maisie Hirono's office or anybody else's office. And uh -huh. you can be on the other side with the, the representatives are all in offices, the Rayburn building and all sitting there. You know, I think you have to go through a metal, metal, a metal detector, but other than that, that. Not in the past, now, I think, now. I but you know that those the, the the openness okay of government the openness of the city of washington i suggest um, at least for the for the years to follow this won't it, it will be less than open they will have to put in more security and 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 we won't have the same access to our buildings and our house as we did before this is this is very troubling and i guess um I guess I, I don't know how that connects. Uh, this is my last question to you. I don't know how that connects with the notion of making it a state. Would a state be safer? Would a state be better? Would a state, you know, preserve the openness of Washington, um, or would making it more federal preserve the openness of Washington? Aside from the you know political considerations of voting fair and having fair representation. How would you vote, is my question, Stephanie, and why? <laughs> well, I think that um, what you've pointed out in, in the, this conversation has gone to that, that special representation or uh, characterization of democracy, which is this federal property being open and being accessible and, and welcoming anybody, any citizen into it to enjoy its beauty and pleasure that is going to change and that and maybe that shouldn't change i mean maybe we need to strive to make it keep it that way and maybe that will require more protection but if we go as a, in into being a state and have more powers and a bigger budgets and um maybe more influence that then we that all can be worked out more equitably uh between the federal government who's going to have the budget for it and what the student city's going to do so I just think that uh, it doesn't hurt to give people representation and more uh, control over their their lives as they live in that city. Um, I, I think I would think the state would improve that, but I, I there's probably- I, I do too, I do too. I, I think they're an orphan child of the way DC works. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they have the same representation. Congress doesn't care so much about the residential areas of DC beyond the federal district. Uh, they don't get a fair shake in, in many ways, and they should. Uh, and what, one thing that strikes me is, that, and this has become stark in our time, is that the whole thing with the uh, electoral votes and, and having only two senators from each state, that was maybe appropriate, you know, in 1783, um, but it is not appropriate today. The population of the country, the, the centers of the country have moved. Um, and it is simply not fair. It is simply not fair um, to have this uh, electoral voting system and to have two senators from each state when some states have very small populations and others have large populations. And so we have to look to reform that, it's my view. Um, we have to look to be flexible and to reflect the changes we have seen. The constitution has to be flexible enough and those in government who who interpret it and who enforce it have to be flexible enough to change the way it works with the changes in times. And one of the changes in times is Washington, DC. Therefore, things ought to be changed. That's why I would vote to make it a state. I, uh, I can agree with you, but I think that we've gone uh, a ways from that because we have or originalism. In other words. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's another conversation, isn't it? <laughs> As to what the Supreme Court would do if this ever happened. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Stephanie Dalton, uh, this is uh, <clears throat> Rediscovering America. There'll be another one, another Rediscovering America show tomorrow at 11. Today, we've been talking about uh, so should Washington, D.C. be made a state? Tomorrow, I'm sure, I'm sure to moral certainty, it'll be close coverage of the inauguration. Thank you so much, Stephanie.
Jay, you've been a pleasure. Yeah, and thank you for joining us. Yes. Aloha.